Hi there. Welcome to Digital Literacy, here, there, and everywhere. Our topic is, what is digital literacy really? It's an outside-in, inside-out, pretty twisted quest for meaning through little tiny conversation pieces, whether through Twitter or through conversations among colleagues. My name is Janet Bell, and I'm here with Tannis Nizal, Adelie Penner, and a whole host of friends who have come to the fore to help via Twitter. Here's a quick intro to me as your host today. I'm Janet Bell. I used to work for Edmonton Public Schools as a picture of the building, um, but now I work across the Edmonton region with uh, district, school districts around our province of Alberta, helping teachers help students as learners in a world where we can make the best use of educational technologies, best use that we possibly can. We have over 200 schools in Edmonton Public Schools, and so the more we can centralize and cascade information out, the better. The digital citizenship site that I developed was based on Mike Ribble's Nine Elements of Digital Citizenship, and so this is just a screenshot of the front page, and of course moved into looking at what digital citizenship looks like in an online environment and how it's interesting these nine elements have held true as an arrow as we've been moving into that online space for blended learning and since the um, pandemic. So we have pages on each of those. We also have a page called Explore at the front. We have parent tip sheets um, based on each one of the nine elements as well. And each of those parent tip sheets is is highlighted one per month of the year from from October actually up until June. We also have information on um, the privacy in Google Apps and a page of school planning resources including responsible use agreements shared by some of our schools, digital citizenship planning templates, scope and sequence documents and such. So I wanted to give you that quick overview because it shows you the kind of culture that I'm coming from and it's very much let's put together patches of packages of information, get them out, people can support within the school and we can be there, we can go into schools, give presentations on, you know, phishing and things like that. And, um, and when issues arise, we can be there to support schools as they work through um, those various things. So this is just a quick screenshot of the front page of the digital literacy section of the site. It looks at um, links primarily as much as we can to Canadian resources such as Media Smarts and um, I believe there's a TED talk on this page that talks about digital literacy and other resources. But here's the thing, in myself, as an educator and as an edtech consultant, I feel there is more we need to know to support our colleagues and students properly. Digital citizenship is not something that we just open up their heads and pour the information in. It's not just the rules and regulations. To me, digital citizenship, and my background originally is as an English teacher, digital literacy in particular is is we are we are swimming in a world where we are being literate on many levels in many ways and this is something that intrigues me and I want to learn more so what I did inside is I thought this is like the game of cat's cradle and you can see these women here are you know have the strings they're playing cat's cradle together and we have this this delicate balance of threads of this is the way we teach things. We have packages, we have lesson plans, we have units. We have different types of activities that students do and in a linear way they work through. But what if we just blew it all up in in a way where those kinds of things weren't just the accepted anymore and people had to really stand on their own two feet and learn for themselves. And so what I did is I took my question, what is digital literacy? And I decided to take that question to Twitter. This was just a couple of days ago. And, um, and all I said in my Twitter post was, what is digital literacy really? And so that's the story that I would like to tell you in this video. Once I realized you should know that I was in deepening waters, I thought I better tap into some other people in person. So I tapped into two of my colleagues in my new job here, um, Tannis and Adley. And so they had a conversation with me that actually went on a long time. So there will be excerpts from that conversation I'd like to share with you as well. At the end of the presentation, just so you can see where we're headed, digital literacy everywhere, these are the tweets that came back on my topic. This is some of my um, 
piecing together and sifting through those tweets, looking for common themes. And at the end of it, we will be asking you some questions and challenges that have come out of working with these themes and working with my conversation with my colleagues. Okay, fasten your seatbelts. Let's go. My challenge, I posted a question to Twitter. I need your help. In one tweet, how do you define digital literacy? Really, I need to hear from people with a variety of backgrounds. Can you respond and tag someone else? I have only a day. And as you can see, I have almost 3,000 impressions, which for me is really like amazing. And um, I have a number of people who responded in here. And then I have a number of people who um, responded to tweets within each of those. So this became particularly confusing to me. How do I take all of this information I'm learning by reading all these tweets and how can I repackage it in a way that I'm actually going to remember and be able to share with you? So what I decided to do was it would be pretty cool to create a Google Jamboard and I could copy paste all of the tweets into my Jamboard and then arrange them into places. In the end, my jam board of notes looked like this, and it was a fascinating um, experiment to move these around and sort them together. And there were actually more notes, but I culled it down in the interest of time and space. But I want to just quickly show you what I discovered en route. To get my information into the jam board, I first created a wakelet. I created an old version wakelet that where I one at a time exported my tweets to the wakelet, but I learned later that you can click on new collection, type your title of your new collection and go straight to tweets. And I was able to just add tweets from me and it would just all together, I could change that to reverse order and I can just select tweets or I can scroll down further and more tweets will appear all the way down. So it was like a very slick way to realize that you can make a weight clut really fast. You do not have to oh, select all. And then you can unselect some if they're off topic. And then you just click. And then your wakelet is made really, really, really quickly. So that's just a little tip about wakelet. So once I had made my um, wakelet, I then decided that it was one thing to see the layout in a mood board view, which looks like a jam board, but moving tweets around in that kind of order wasn't appropriate. So I did recreate the jam board by taking key ideas out of each of the tweets that were in the wakelet. Okay, full transparency here. I was getting so tired typing information, sometimes copy pasting, etc., from the tweets and the wakelet that in the end I sort of gave up. But even what I had there so far, I had quite a bit of information and I was able to sort them around and arrange them into some rather interesting themes. So if we move from right to left, uh, let's grab my little pointer here. You'll see that the first part, I have this um, digital platforms in general. By the way, I loved using Jamboard in the end because every um, square is the same size, so easy to move. Anyway, so under digital platforms in general, this was mostly knowing how to use the tools, knowing, having some skills, knowing the lingo, um, direct teaching, because through that, that's how kids are going to learn that. Maybe have a curriculum that you're going to follow, transferable skills, so you've learned this, how else are you going to apply it? And just basically understanding how, you know, what tools would be best to use to which purpose, um, and also being aware of privacy, security, that kind of thing. So it's the platforms, it's the skills, and it's the vocabulary all on the right-hand side. Moving closer to the middle is this um, reflection and critical analysis side. It seems almost a little bit like Bloom here. So this is when um, you know you're asking those questions from a critical literacy perspective. Um, whose voice is shown through this tweet thread? Is this something that is pushing a particular political agenda, for example? So it's this sort of questioning and and really interrogating, which is a word um, that I'm going to you're going to hear later from one of my colleagues. Um, it's this critical literacy, safety and analysis pieces, students looking with a, um, analyzing with a digital lens, um, applying creativity and functional skills. And this moves over to this idea of choice when students begin to create authentic products through media 
and a remix mindset. And this is where it gets exciting because the right half here is them getting the skills and the mindset, but now they have that and they can start to build stuff. And once students become makers and start to um, develop that ability to move from one app to another using the, the affordances to help them create what they want to create, this is when they become really engaged and good things happen. So we talked about uh, media and remix mindset. And of course, as I just kind of referred, that relates to that fluency. They become confident, they become agile, shifting contexts and platforms, and that creates a new way of being for that person. And they start to develop those linguistic and sociological code switching pieces that came up in this um in this Twitter conversation. So it's fascinating is the scope is wide. Culture plays a huge part. And um, oh, and I've been reminded to go back and read Doug Belshaw's work. So shout out to Doug Belshaw. And this whole notion of trans literacy and culture is totally intriguing. Uh, we have a couple, we have a, a reference to a paper written by one of the contributors in the, in the Twitter conversation. And we're really looking at what is it um, that we need to, um, be able to be like in our own culture in order to code and decode the multi-discourse within the digital ecosystem. So we have moved very much from this, basically, here are my skills to use the platform all the way down to how can I develop, how can I understand these multi-levels of discourse within a digital ecosystem. Incredible conversation. I didn't know what to do next, so I took it to my colleagues, and here are comments that they made in a conversation that expanded over two hours and ended up with a side conversation of how we should probably start a podcast, but that's another story. Here's what they had to say about this particular conversation. I think a big part of it for us teachers is that for our students to be able to move from this side over to this side, Students creating authentic products is a big part of that. If they're able to navigate the media and remix things, then um, they are going to be able to demonstrate those habits of mind that we're talking about increasingly, even as we move over to this side of the page. So let's take a little bit more of a look at students creating authentic products. And I'd like you to listen to my colleague, Adelie, as she talks about students using it in the field. Are there gaps? Sometimes we can make assumptions that we, about people that because they can do some things on, on the computer or some pieces of technology, that they might be able to do everything. And so a teacher in a classroom could make the assumption that, oh, my students are very savvy. They can jailbreak their phones and they know about all the updates and they, know, and they can upgrade their phone and they know the widgets as soon as they come out, that those same students understand how to leverage those te that technology to support learning and to support student achievement and that and that we could make assumptions that hey everyone i want you to demonstrate your learning in the way that you know best make a movie make a blog you know do your thing and students don't know necessarily how to do or their thing and and when we put it in the context of the larger literacy you know, my mom might be able to message me and understand how to send a text back and forth. And then someone shows her that emoji keyboard. <laughs> and right. does she understand how folks are using emojis? And that 13 maybe is too much. It sends a, a complicated message in, in that text message. And so I, I think part of being literate is, is understanding how to leverage that the tool to be able to communicate or demonstrate what we need. I'm thinking from that literacy perspective, where do you take that? It made me think about, you know, teachers trying to find and, and trying to give kids choice, the ways that they can show what they know and in a robust way, something that's, that's rigorous. Over the last couple of years, I've been trying to push teachers to think about a different kind of summative assessment to really get at kids' understanding of what they've read. So for example, podcasts, NPR puts out some wonderful uh, manuals for teachers on how to teach kids to use podcasts, right? How to leverage that in your classroom. And the example that I showed was uh, for a novel where kids took on you know, the characters or, or it could be the authors, but the characters, the main characters, in three different novels that they had read and had them speaking to each other. 
right? So creating, um, you know, having texts talk to each other, right? And the power of that in terms of getting at kids' understanding, you can't fake that. There's no way that you can gain that at all. Um, and I think if you want to know something about technology or if you want to use that, don't worry about it. Your kids will show you. Well, in fact, no. Um, to your point, Adelie, kids don't know how to do a podcast. <laughs> so again, I think it's teachers. But if we go back to digital literacy and the confidence that I spoke about in, um, in my response to your, your tweet uh, was it's, the, it's that confidence uh, as teacher, um, you know, literate, digital literate teachers um, to try something and to take that and, and spend the time on that rather than on creating that multiple choice test, right? So it's, it's giving them, uh, you know, that opportunity to play, knowing that in the long run, that assessment piece is going to be a lot more authentic. I really like what you're bringing into it. It's that critical thinking piece. When we start to give kids that that power to critically think and analyze to say, okay, well, I have an update. How do I read, first of all, what's in that update? And how can I then make decisions about whether or not I should move forward? I think then we start to get to get closer into the pieces that, that Tannis is talking about in terms of looking at, and then again, who is recommending the upgrade? Why do they want you to do the upgrade? Who, what money is behind that upgrade? Most of us have our phones to set to upgrade automatically. In the spirit of digital literacy, one might interrogate that perspective and that behavior. Some of what you just said, uh, Adelie, um, you know, from a critical literacy perspective, and that was again something that that I, you know, mentioned in in my response, uh, my tweet was, you know, that it's it's one thing to have the tools, but then it's another thing to to, as, to use your term, interrogate, um, you know, those tools and what they can do for us. I love the New York Times uh, Learning Network. They're doing some really powerful things uh, for teachers and students. And uh, they're, they're actually running a, um, just a brief webinar um, on reading uh, infographics for example, right? So it, there, there might be something, for example, on, uh, you know, the latest um, phone technology and what's, you know, what, what's being said there. And again, you know, who's, who's presenting the data? What is the, what story is the data telling us? So we talk about, you know, in language arts, matters of choice, right? So what choices is that text creator making? in order to shape that data and that information in a particular way so that that consumer feels something, uh, reacts in some way, um, acts as a result of of those choices. So um, yeah, it's back to critical literacy again for me. Amy Burval, she said, McLuhan is God and, um, oh dear, and King, rematch, and re and and ma- the mashup mashup is king. So McLuhan is God. The mashup is king. Um, I'm curious, given what we're saying so far, how you guys would respond to that. Maybe Tannis. Well, I mean, the medium is the message. You know, like this is what we talked about, right? So we're gonna you know, quote McLuhan, right? So he that. So what is the medium that's being used? So back to an infographic, or yeah, I call everything text. Conversation is text. Um, body language it's always reading you know reading uh the situation i think i think the mashup is actually quite powerful Mm -hmm. and i think mashups have been used in many ways in many forms to provide a different lens right when we think about conceptual understanding we think about different context and we think about how are we learning how do we view the world a mashup allows us to put on another set of glasses literally and figuratively Mm -hmm. to think about something that we thought we knew really well and and it also allows us to then within mashups you can start to add three or four lenses simultaneously around a period right to look at to look at a war to use the example that you just used to look at a war through 80s the context of the 80s and to bring in the the culture of the music right the hair bands and things at the time then to think about contextually with a costuming and, and some of the other pieces and, and then co- do the compare and contrast and start to think about um, bringing it in. One thing that a mashup also does very well is bring empathy mm-hmm. and, and emotion in, into context. And I think that's the piece that, that's 
starts then when we go back to that digital literacy piece, um, you start to see themes of safety coming in, in terms of, okay, when I'm doing a mashup and I'm going to be looking at things from a different perspective, to, to go back to what Tana said, how am I critically looking at those pieces to ensure that I'm still safe? So I'm reading this newspaper article and I'm getting this perspective but have I taken the time to understand who's writing it and why they're writing it and what the information was designed for in terms of their point of view, which, which again, Tannis was just speaking about, because then it starts to make me wonder about when do I give my credit card? When do I not? When am I going to be answering questions and giving out personal information? And when do I not? And starting to understand some of the conceptual pieces around what am I experiencing as a digital citizen online because do I have the literacy to support good citizenship? I think one thing I'm hearing you say here um, kind of between the lines is that digital literacy is so much more than digital. It's about the literacy, not about the digital. And so whether that text, you know, whatever format that text takes is, is almost irrelevant that way. Well, maybe not, but, but it's about one of the words that came up through the Twitter conversation um, was that the idea that we shouldn't call it digital literacy, we should call it trans literacy. And that was a real takeaway for me um, because I thought, yeah, it's, it's, it's like when we talk about digital citizenship and it's like now we take the word digital out of it because it's just our world. And, and yes, it's still something, like you said, it still needs to be named um, because by naming it, we make it something. And of all ages to live in, having the idea that literacy reaches across all these places is really important that we know that and to know that we need to know how to read and write and do in those spaces. Not all digital literacy skills are online, mm-hmm. right? And right. That was the piece of the trans that I really appreciated was that when, can I use a word processing? Can I be digital and use some of those pieces around tech and can I, and, and what does it mean to be online? Because sometimes we blur that as all digital together. And so yes. I appreciated that trans conversation to start to disaggregate what are we talking about? And that it is a multifaceted skill set that we're asking and we're, and we're actually speaking about. And maybe we haven't been implicit and clear enough around our naming to, to be able to then unpack because we can't, if we can't name it and we can't talk about our practice, we can't actually duplicate and replicate, right? We can't actually be uh, intentional about those things. And so that was intriguing to me about that trans piece. Yes. And so then, um, so Tannis was talking about the different lenses. And so, you know, through the different likes of characters with various points of view, attitudes, whatever. So, you know, the feminist, the whatever. Um, And she said, talked about looking at lenses in discrete pieces. And so in my mind, as you were sharing that, Tannis, I was thinking, the lenses of those different life views. And then I was thinking of the, the lenses of, of whatever this sort of reading, writing, transliteracy piece. I'm ha- and I'm trying to figure out how that works. Like, how do we teach our kids all of that? How do we get there? Mm-hmm. Like what I'm hearing you to say that it around intention, we need to think about how our brains work, right? In our in our three cycles of, of learning. So am I at the stage where I'm getting the information? So I'm opening the top of my head and my teacher's doing the mind dump and telling me about digital literacy. Am I am I given opportunities to make meaning and create my own opportunities to create neural pathways and really understand the information that I've just done? And then can I get to the third place around having reciprocity for that learning so that when I leave that classroom and I'm in other places where now I'm again online or on a computer or working, that I can take the lessons that I learned from my English class or my math class or science or CTS or somewhere and then use that and apply that to, to my life and to other contexts. And I wonder, and it becomes a bit of a pedagogical bloom conversation around where do we allow or how do we allow our students 
to get to the place where they are really in that in that big mind place to make to to be able to leave and have reciprocity for their learning because i see digital literacy and citizenship often talked about at a very surface level we give some information to kids and then we think they know it and we walk away and so the piece that you keep coming back to that i'm really appreciating is that critical piece we need to let kids make meaning of it and then and then create their own pathways. They need to build their own concepts, right? So it, it, it and that's I think that you know where where we're going with with education is that I don't want to tell them what to think. I want to give them the tools with which to think. When I talk to her, some students and my nephew and nieces to watch how they feel, their their concern about the digital trail that they leave is significantly different than the one that I am worried about. Mm-hmm. And it, it it's curious to me as as folks move forward living their life online, what will that what will that mean? And and will that change the digital literacy? Will it change a culture? Mm-hmm. to which we think about how how we're living right and, and what will literacy look like from that perspective because my nephews and nieces would argue that to be digitally literate means that you're share you're checking in you know how to check in at a restaurant you know how to share what movie you're seeing you know how to to share the things about your life that you want to what you're doing every day and that you know you can you can find your way around um, to share those pieces for them it's part of telling their story and, and we see now kids are being born and parents are starting Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of the accounts for them and are pu- pu- punching on their behalf. And so this kid who grows up with their entire life, diaper changes included, online, what is their perspective and what do they need to know uh, to continue to navigate and be and be part of that piece but it does mean that it pushes my idea about what digital literacy then is going to evolve and be because it has been quite narrow and it's really opening something has exploded in it and that's been going on for a little bit of time now the other piece to that is the pandemic and i i liked your yes. comment about culture because the digital world has been the other world and the face-to-face person has been the world. And now that we've done this like incredible global flip, the world this the other world is kind of more the world for yeah. for many of us in the work that we do and the interactions that we have. And so you think of, you know, a child who's in kindergarten, grade one, grade two in an all online environment, what is that experience like? How is that formatively shaping them and their view to online stuff as they grow along with those other things that you're talking about? Mm-hmm. Um, if you were to put a challenge out to other people who've kind of watched this sort of haphazard collection of statements and things, what would you ask people or challenge them to do as a result of being immersed in the Twitter and the conversations Hmm. we need to mull yeah advice is an interesting word um I don't know there's lots of things I could say yeah telling people to to do like you know I think it's reflecting on your own your own experience in the digital world and also looking at you know ways that you can leverage the digital world to build those literacy skills yeah I loved your sense of the in, the intentionality and, yeah. and, and you know, those lenses it comes down to the teacher learner too right so how comfortable um you know is it is is an individual just just generally with with trying something new and uh right. their own, uh, learning platform like what is what is that person's learning platform is it, is it a single, you know, kind of, what is, what is that? Is it multimodal, like, or is it very much, you know, print privileged or I, I don't, it's so much about, about the learner themselves, right? Yeah. I know. Adam. I think my child would be, yeah, I think my child would be just to stay curious, mm-hmm. stay curious, stay ready to, to look at, at, things from all perspectives and and to ask your why and and 
the why the why that this is in front of you and and what your own personal why is and that while you're while you're moving your way through um sorting these things out for yourselves that you keep your own person and your own personal integrity intact as you as you move your way through because as we move down different rabbit holes our perception and, and things can change. And so it's important to stay curious to go down those pieces, but also remember who you are and, and your why. And, and I think folks will be okay. I think they're going to be just fine. That's very interesting. I think for me, part of my takeaway from this rabbit hole of the last 24 hours is that these are questions that keep me up at night and have for years. Um, and I have sort of gone down a bit and stopped and gone down a bit and stopped. And the, some of the comments coming back through the Twitter chat opened, it was like mind blown and then mind blown again. And, and I think for me, you know, you've heard me talk before about, about blind spots and how that intrigues me. Um, but it certainly for me was a humbling experience to to know that, that the pieces to answer these questions are all there, but it's like we need to use our transliteracy skills ourselves in order to navigate that and, and, and find that out. And, and so I think maybe a challenge that, that I might wanna give would be, would be something to do with that. I think it's neat that Adelie, you're saying like to ask your why and I feel that between the lines of what you're saying here, Thanos as well, when thinking of your learning platform and single and multiple, is kind of like a know your who. And it's like if we know if you know your who and you know your why, and maybe for me it's it's know your one of those other ones, but I'm not sure if it says the what or I have to figure that out. But I wonder if if we can make this really, if it's actually quite simple in the end, it just comes down to very basic questions. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I think, um, and again, we, we've we've talked about, you know, the, the assumptions we make about our students and their digital literacies and really how literate are they. But I think we also, um, back to the why is, you know, we need to meet our students where they, where they are and where they're going. And so I think sometimes that involves getting out of our, our comfort zone. Um, uh, and I'm not just talking about, you know, people who are techie and aren't, aren't techie and because that's a whole other, you know, conversation, but being willing to have conversations um, and interact, you know. That's it. Yeah, it's that. It is a humility thing. It's it's being able to to open up where all the gaps are. And, and, and being open to having those conversations that help to help to make that meaning that, that you're talking about, about that whole meaning making piece. With us being, you know, in a, in a blended in, you know, environment, right. Or, you know, just face-to-face -face or online, you know, online teachers are really, really struggling right now. Um, it's hard, right. Taking what you're used to doing face-to-face -face and, you know, recreating it in a way that feels like it's playing with with your non-dominant hand. And I think um, the, 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 the danger of not inquiring and being, as you said, curious, sadly, about how I can still do those things that I feel are very high leverage for student learning, um, but, but with a different in a different way. Thank you so much for watching our presentation. As you'll see, we have been looking at digital literacy on a number of different levels, right from the granular, how do you get a handout out to parents, up to that meta level of what are the kinds of skills we need to be learning now in order to navigate a transliteral world, which is now as well. Thanks for coming. Our challenges are on the screen. Tana says, know your who. And for teachers, we need to know ourselves and our students as learners have conversations. Adelie says, know your why. Stay curious, stay grounded. And I, Janet, I figured it out. It's the where. That's what I was looking for. Know your where in a transliteral blended world where teaching and learning feel clunky to those not used to that particular world. Be the change and be humble. And I almost forgot, always have empathy and 
of course, remember to play.